thank everybody um, for coming out to Gulf Coast State College today. Uh, my name is Greg Robinson. Welcome to our first citizen science seminar of the semester. Um, I am going to go ahead and pass the mic off to Michelle Council, who is the uh, president of vice president of um, St. Andrews Baywatch, just to say a couple of quick things. Thanks, Greg. Like Greg said, I'm a member of St. Andrews Baywatch, and we have three main programs right now that are geared toward protecting the estuary, first of which is our, our sampling and monitoring program, where we, on a monthly basis, go out and monitor and collect samples from 70 different locations in the estuary for, for analysis and to input into a, into a database. Secondly, there's grasses and classes where we partner with local schools to go in and, and teach kids about um, how important it is to protect the environment, how they can become involved in that, and it ends with a, a practical project outside at the end of the program. We also have um, uh, living shorelines where we will go if landowners have a, a hardened seawall that they want to replace with natural materials such as uh, oyster shells and natural grasses, we'll go in and do that, that replacement for them. So we're always, we always need volunteers for St. Andrews Baywatch. If you're interested, go to standrewsbaywatch.org and there's a number of ways, like I said, to, uh, to get involved. And with that, I want to introduce Dr. Jessica Graham She's the director of the St. Joe and St. Andrews program. And she'll go over their objectives, the early priorities, and current activities. So, Dr. Graham. Thank you. Can you all hear me okay? Okay. <clears throat> well, thank you so much for that introduction. Uh, St. Andrew Baywatch is an incredibly important partner of the estuary program their work to collect all of that water quality that uh, Michelle mentioned is really feeding a lot of those priorities and objectives for our future decisions. But I do wanna just kind of talk about what is an estuary program. And so estuary programs are new to us in this area, but not new across the nation. So there are 28 different estuary programs across the nation. And they are very much geared towards being non-regulatory and stakeholder driven. So this is not resource management associations or agencies that are coming in and telling these estuary communities what they should be doing. This is community driven. It is the communities coming around the table and having a role in every single level up to the elected officials that make the final decisions. And they're all telling the communities and informing everyone of what needs to be done and setting out that blueprint for how we're going to get there. <clears throat> now, St. Andrew and St. Joseph Bay's estuary program is not a nationally recognized estuary program, but we are one of three panhandle estuary programs. Basically, we thought that we needed it and we started it. <laughs> We will hopefully, um, if it is the community's desire to go after a national recognition, that is potentially something that we can do. Um, but right now we are just trying to move forward in figuring out what that blueprint or what that plan is going to be based on what the communities say. So we are very unique. We are one of the only watersheds in the Panhandle or the only watershed in the Panhandle that is completely um, entirely within the state of Florida. The other Panhandle estuary programs are also extending up into Alabama, and so they have to do a lot of different coordinations and, and have a lot of different programs, and we get to kind of focus on our small little area and make sure everything that we're doing really reflects for the estuary uh, systems. Our estuary is extremely saline compared to other estuaries because we don't have that freshwater input. We have Econ Fina Creek coming in, but the, a lot of the other estuaries are much more riverine um, influence, which reduces that salinity. With this high salinity, we have a lot of biodiversity. We have a lot of different kinds of animals in the estuary and in our watershed. 
And we all know if you live here, this yep. estuary is extremely recreationally and economically important. There's a lot of tourists that come visit. Uh, we always tell our kids when they complain about traffic that you know, people save all year long to come down here and spend a week and we are lucky enough to live here. So that's a little background about the program as a whole, getting into more of the details. So our estuary program has been modeled off of those national estuary programs, taking bits and pieces that we felt would work best for our community. And so this is our governance structure is what I talk about. So we have three main levels to our governance, and that's really just who's gonna make what decision, where is this information coming from, and who is ultimately saying, yes, this is what we should do. And so we have, if we start from the bottom, you can see community stakeholders. That's everyone. That's not these community stakeholders or those community stakeholders, that is everyone. And they represent and have representation on these different advisory committees. We right now have three different advisory committees. We have the STEM or the Science, Technology, Engineering, and Modeling Committee. We have the Citizen Action Committee, or I tend to call it um, Education Outreach as well, I interchange. And then we have the Development and Finance Committee. <clears throat> then moving up, you have estuary staff. And I'll get more into each one of these in just a second. Further up, that is all informing. So everything those advisory committees are doing are informing what I should be doing. <laughs> and I refine it. And then I send it up to the management council. The management council is designed to be extremely diverse with perspectives from a lot of different places within the communities. And so they basically check it make sure it's representative of what our communities need and what our industries need, et cetera. And then they say, yes, no, yes, we like this, but refine this, it goes back to us. And then eventually recommended to the policy board. The policy board is made up of two different um, designations. One of them is a voting member. Those are our elected officials. We've got commissioners, mayors, and then a, represent a representative from FSUPC because they're the host of the program. And then we have the non-voting members, which are your state and federal and even local um, resource management. So US Fish and Wildlife Service, Florida Fish and Wildlife, um, Conservation Commission, those types of more resource managers to be able to help advise the policy board on anything more environmental and then be able to provide that insight before those decisions are being made. <clears throat> All right, so more details. We're getting further into details. So the STEM committee. These are members from usually a more technical background, um, academia, um, they could be um, retired individuals that used to be in these different resource management uh, agencies that are still active in the community, have a vested interest and want to be involved. They can be folks from FWC as well or US Fish and Wildlife Service or any other different uh, resource management. And we also are looking to add in some infrastructure, so public works folks that are dealing with a lot of the wastewater and stormwater issues within these, these municipalities, and then nonprofits. <clears throat> so all of their roles and responsibilities are really on that technical side. Let's make sure our science is as sound as we can possibly make it to help inform those decisions. And so we're working right now on a goal framework. What are our goals going to be? What, how are we going to structure it? And then how are we going to message it? All of that is currently being worked on um, by a small STEM committee. We're always open to new people coming in. Ultimately, this is all going to go and feed up to those recommendations to the management council. So everything we're doing, we're making the outline, we're making the goal framework, all of that's gonna go up to the management council and they're gonna say, yeah, we kinda like this, what about this? And then we'll take it further from there. The Citizen Action Committee, this one has had a slow start. We're really looking for folks that are interested in being on this committee to get us moving. 
this committee is going to be really deciding on what are our what are our strategies going to be for the community so how can we get out into the different communities to raise awareness of the estuary program as well as the importance of the estuaries as well as what are the projects that we can do who are we going to work with in order to do some different programs what programs are working which ones are not and what can we do to help get those programs even bigger again all of this gets fed up to that management council, making sure that we're hitting on all of the communities. We have a lot of different diversity on that management council. That's not just you know the industry or it's not just the academia, it's everybody. And then the development and finance committee, arguably this is the most important one, <laughs> also not in existence right now. So we're really working to figure out what does this look like, who can really play a good role in this development and finance, but they're charged with figuring out how we're gonna be sustainable. So everything takes money, as does our program. We have been funded by Bay County through their Pot One Restore funds, as well as the Nature Conservancy to be established. The idea is once we're established, we bring in additional funds. So that can be a diverse um, source of funding. But this Development and Finance Committee is going to be the one that's really out there looking at a lot of different options so that we're not just funded through federal grants or we're not just funded through one county or two counties, but it's a diverse um, portfolio of funding so that we can make sure that those programs that we're talking about can be sustainable. Again, all going up to that management council. So everything is being worked on in these advisory committees. These are really the ones that are putting in more time and effort um, to create, and then the management council is reviewing and approving or tweaking. So then we have staff. Um, so everything's going up. We refine it. Uh, we coordinate a lot of these meetings and everything. Right now, our staff is just me. <laughs> We're working on hiring our scientist right now, um, conducting interviews this week and next. And then I have a public outreach specialist position. It closes tomorrow. So if you know anyone or want to pass it along or want to apply yourself, please do so. And you can find that on the FSU job board website. But we're all going to be, eventually will be three full-time staff and one part-time staff. The technical assistant is a part-time staff um, that are really working to try to keep this program moving forward. And I just wanted to talk a little bit about this management council. This is a really important group because they are the ones that are really going to be looked at by the policy board of, did you make sure that this represents everything? Because when you come from a STEM committee, it's going to be very technical. When you come from a citizen action committee, it's going to have it geared towards one way or the other. And this management council is really there to put that balance in the, into everything coming out. And so we have 15 members that are representatives from different um, sectors. We have academia, business, industry, economy, recreation. And we are looking at them to really review pro that perspective in, and then everything goes up to the policy board from this step. So everything's coming up and going up further to the policy board. Obviously, there can be some iterations within that. And so how does the SGA program really get to that end goal? Um, through consensus. So we are not, no, you're wrong, this is the way it's gonna be. It's very much building consensus. So this is where we have a group that's helping to facilitate called the Consensus Center out of FSU. And this is the, the kind of um, stop and go system that they use to be like, okay, can you live with it? Can we move forward with it? Or are you absolutely unhappy? You just can't live with it. So it's, you know, if we do things right, pretty much, you know, compromise, right? No one's happy at the end of a compromise. <laughs> so if we're doing things right, no one should be happy. Um, but hopefully the long-term goals is what everyone's going to be seeing is the long-term benefits. And all of this, all these different committees, all these different representatives are all working together in collaboration to get to our mission, which is to improve 
our common sense, science-based understanding of the needs of our estuary because we need to protect it. We know that this is economically, recreationally, incredibly vital resource that we have to be able to protect and sustain into the future. And all of that is going to meeting our vision, which is long, <laughs> but it is healthy, resilient bays and estuarine habitats, that support native species, natural systems, recreation, fisheries, and the economy together with vibrant, resilient, and sustainable communities. This program is really where science meets the social context. I don't know how many exercises or efforts I've been a part of that have been very science-based, scientific planning, anywhere from multi-state to small watersheds like the one that's up on our, our watershed here that just tend to fall short because they can't incorporate that social context. And so the estuary program is really trying to have that foundation in the science to help inform those decisions, understanding that, again, if we're all working correctly, no one's happy. Um, and so we're trying to find that balance between the social demands and needs and the needs of the estuary. And so that is really what that vision is speaking to is that Everybody's got needs, let's find where we can make sure that we are um, sustainable. So I mentioned that we have a blueprint that we're working on. This blueprint is called the Comprehensive Conservation and Management Plan. And so this is very much going to set our actions and our focus for the next five to 10 years. And so that's what we're working to create now. We have a deadline to have that done by June, 2023. Most of those national estuary programs that I talked about earlier get five years. <laughs> we get two. Um, I came on a little bit late, so I look at it as one and a half. <laughs> so we have a lot of work to do, and that's why those committees are going to be so vitally important to populate and get moving on making these decisions so that we can get them into this plan and start moving then towards implementation. So the plan is not where it stops. It is a continuing circle of what are our priority issues, let's, what are our goals, objectives, what are we gonna work on? And then we have to make sure, are we making a difference? If we're not making a difference, we have to change. If we are making a difference, maybe we can bolster that and make it more effective. So the Comprehensive Conservation and Management Plan, or the CCMP is the way we talk about it. Um, what is it? It is very much a guide for decision making. It's a synthesis of science. It's grounded in the science. It's a reflection of all of the inputs from citizens. It's very much community. What do you guys need for this to be sustainable? It's hopefully going to be a catalyst for large collaborative, collaborative efforts. We have a lot of different municipalities in the county and a couple different counties involved in this watershed. We have to go bigger and think bigger and work together. And the estuary program is one of those catalysts for being able to bring those folks together. And it is a living document. When it is published, it will likely change the next day. <laughs> and that's good. We want it to evolve. We want it to keep um, being checked and used. And so with that, it will change. And so that's why there's a revision process that will be worked into it. What it isn't, it is not regulatory. We are not telling someone what to do and where to do it at all. We are trying to provide that information for decision, decision makers, but we are not telling them that to do it. It is not a binding document. Those people who are part of the policy board and management council and the advisory committees, it is not holding them to that just because they approve it to go into the CCMP. Um, if they approve that we want to try to implement some sort of nutrient criteria, it's not going to hold them and their municipality to that. Hopefully, we will see a move to be able to do that, but that's not saying you must do this. You approved it. It is not at all binding. And it's not a means of assigning blame. We're not trying to use science to identify who's doing something wrong. We're trying to use science to identify where we can work together to do something good. 
and it is definitely not the answer. So we're gonna learn a lot. We're gonna synthesize a lot of science and we're gonna understand hopefully a lot more than we do now, but it, there's gonna be a lot of unknowns that we still have to work to figure out. And again, the living document to be able to incorporate it. So this is just one example of how this might look in the CCMP. This is what we're working on now, is that goal framework. Are we going to have goals objectives? Are we going to have themes and strategies? So all of that is really what that STEM committee is working through currently, to be able to then put that in the CCMP and message it. And that's the important component that the STEM committee, um, we have to balance between being too technical but then losing the, the message of this is what we're doing and why we're doing it. So current activities. Um, I mentioned we have that deadline of June of 2023. So we have been pretty busy. I came on board in August, so I'm oh, not even six months into the position. But we have held um, a workshop where the community was able to come virtually and tell us, you know, what is wrong, what are the stressors, what are the management concerns, what do we need to look at? And then that informed us of where to go get science. And we've been very fortunate to have a group out of UF and UWF working together to do this synthesis. Um, so it takes a lot off of me while I can staff up. We've then had a management council orientation meeting. So we finally got them going, um, got them oriented to what their roles are, uh, had a lot of great participation and a lot of excitement around the table. And it's really great to see how much support there is for this program. We had a coastal management and planning workshop. Um, this was a group out of Auburn that is really looking at the impacts to Hurricane Michael um, on our forests in particular and how we might be hitting a tipping point when it comes to forest cover. So they have a three-year study. We won't have a lot of the science um, done for the CCMP, but that's why it's a living document. And so they're really looking at how much did we lose? What are the impacts to the water quality now? How can we fix that? And then they're even interviewing forest land owners to understand what the risk of losing more for, forest is. So what are, what are their decision points of when they may sell, when they may um, cut? And so I think it'll really be a great um, amount of information coming in for um, informing what to do next. The policy board has met. Um, they have been more in the update cycle, but we're about to get into the action cycle now. And that's really where we are in this first part of the year. We have a workshop series. Um, then we'll be doing a lot of different meetings with the different committees and having a public input workshop that will be in person somewhere around the community. We may even have to have two to split across some of the counties. And that's going to be geared more for um, general public and stakeholders. Right now, these workshops are a little more technical, um, but we're hoping to be able to hit every um, aspect of the community through the first part of this year. And so we've had our first January workshop last week, and then we're going to have our next two workshops um, in February. So we have one next week and then the following two weeks after that. So that's where we are. There's a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot to do. <laughs> so this is just a save the date. Uh, these are our workshop dates. Again, we had the first one. So zoom in, we have another one, February 9th, and then the last one, February 23rd. And I just want to take a minute to kind of talk about what these look like, um, because they do tend to be geared towards the more technical folks. And so this is the one that we had. You don't need to read this, but this is um, a virtual workshop. Everyone's virtual, no hybrid. And so we're asking them, what are the gaps? In this uh, workshop, we focused on water and sediment, quality and quantity. So what are the gaps in our knowledge? What do we not know about things? Um, and so people, the, these sticky notes are different people that are on there that can put their own sticky notes up and put in whatever they want to type. And then we work through that and combine anything that might be duplicative and then clarify anything that we may not fully understand. And then they vote on that. The stakeholders on the, on the um, webinar vote on, you know, what are your top four or five 
um, gaps that we need to focus on first because the estuary program in the first five years can't do everything and our partners can't do everything and that's really what the estuary program is just a collaborative of partners um, but we need to figure out what's most important for us to be able to work on and then we did the same thing um, looking at what are your actions okay so we know that there's some projects that's the column over there we know there's a lot going on in the area we kind of we've been, I guess, um, there's a blessing out of the disaster, right? So we've had a lot of money coming in since Hurricane Michael, and the um, local elected officials are really prioritizing what needs to happen. So we wanted to make sure that we were putting those up there and acknowledging all of the great work going on. But then what else needs to happen? And then the same thing, we, we went ahead and voted. So we had top two for each of the different things. So we had top two monitoring studies that need to happen, top two policy. Um, it's not really policy, but something that can help inform where policy may wanna go with the, with the uh, local leaders. Restoration, education outreach, these are all the recommendations from the group that was on the webinar. These will be refined and um, then presented to the management council and the policy board and then the general public and so then that's where we'll get additional feedback of i don't even know what you're talking about why would you focus on this this is what really needs to happen that's the feedback we want we want to understand from all the different aspects so how can you get involved uh, we have a website um, off of the fsu panama city website it's the pc.fsu.edu, and it's just the SASJ, which is St. Andrew, St. Joe, Bay's estuary program. And you can go on the website. If you scroll down, you see these different vision mission and these different tiles that you can interact with. We also post our events up here. So you'll see those two workshops I mentioned are still posted up here. Um, we're about to be scheduling a couple more meetings. They are always open to the public. You are always welcome to call into any meeting. If you click on governance, you're gonna see a nice description of the different things I talked about today. And then when you go to advisory committees and you click on there, you're gonna be met with a, hey, you can sign up. So you can be a part of the advisory committees. Anyone can be a part of the advisory committees. You can sign up through this form or you can email me directly and we'll get you on the list so that you're notified of those meetings. All of this, everything, like I said, is it, we're a big collaborative of partners. So we have to put together the pieces of what everyone is doing around the estuary to really figure out how we can come together and work together to protect the estuary. And that's all I have, I'll take any questions. <laughs> well, how are the national programs different from what this program does? So when you're nationally recognized, it's actually an act of Congress. My, my understanding is that it is an act of Congress that has to be put into a bill and passed at, at the con congressional level. And so that has to be then designated, and that means you get it sustainable funding from EPA. You get a little bit of money every year for annual operations from the EPA. But um, there hasn't been a new national estuary program designated in, I think it's 10 to 20 years, possibly longer. So it's been a really long time. Um, Pensacola Perdido is currently working to seek um, that designation, I believe. But that's not something that we wanted to go ahead and try to do without really having our feet underneath us. And, and that really is something that needs to come from the community. Because although there are benefits, there's always a cost, right? And so I don't know enough about those national programs to understand the trade-offs. Um, but ideally, that's where we would want to go to be able to access some of those funds. Because not only do you get access to those sustainable operational funds, you get access to additional restoration funds um, being that designation. So. Yeah. 
So the estuary, the National Estuarine Research Reserve in Apalachicola is actually different. It's different even than the National Estuary Programs. So there's a research, they're kind of more of a research arm is my understanding. Yeah. But we will learn a lot from them. <laughs> so we're, we're looking to, um, yes, uh, understand what they're doing, what they've learned in their system, and see if we can apply similar methods over here for different projects. Other questions? Well, if they come to you later, you can email me or give me a, a call. Um, if you call, leave a message. I'm in and out of my office a lot, but I'm happy to answer any questions, and thank you very much for being here. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Graham. Um, just a real quick announcement, our next uh, citizen science lecture series will be here on February 22nd. Uh, the speaker will be Mike Brim. He will be discussing a contaminant study of St. Andrew Bay, so kind of right along the lines of uh, some of the science that will go into what we were just learning about. So hopefully you guys can make it out and we will see you then. Thank you.